This episode of North O2 is brought to you by Brilliant.org. Since the dawn of civilization, man has credited its origins with gods and other visitors from the stars. What if it were true? Did extraterrestrial beings really help to shape our history? All over the world, artifacts are being discovered with a common theme. Extraterrestrial beings that have one thing in common. Massive Okay, all jokes aside, today on North O2, we are once again going to be talking about amazing ancient artifacts. And yes, I'll be talking about phallic statues, and I hope my sponsors don't drop me for that. So anyways, artifacts are really cool. They are objects made by humans that have some sort of cultural meaning behind them. Sometimes they allow us to see incredibly detailed stories from the past, and other times we are left with a bizarre snapshot of a culture that no longer is. So first, let's talk about these artifacts. Despite how humorous they might appear to us in the modern day, these statues are very serious depictions of the fertility god Min. Min's cult was created in the pre-dynastic period. It was centered around the cities Koptos and Panopolis of Upper Egypt. He was worshipped here with great festivals and presentations of offerings. His importance grew during the Middle Kingdom when he became closely linked with Horus as the deity Min Horus. By the New Kingdom, he was also fused with Amun in the form Min Amun, who was also the bull of his mother, aka father of his own mother as well as her son. As a central deity of fertility and possibly orgiastic rituals, Min became identified by the Greeks with the god Pan. Pan was also a fertility deity, among other things. One feature of Min worship was the wild prickly lettuce. The Egyptians believed this lettuce had aphrodisiac and opiate qualities, and it produces latex when cut, possibly identified with semen. Male deities as vehicles for fertility and potency rose to prevalence at the emergence of widespread agriculture around the world. Male Egyptians associated their ability to produce bountiful harvests with their own fertility. Thus, male gods of virility such as Osiris and Min were more developed during this time. Min was honored during the coronation rites of the New Kingdom, when the pharaoh was expected to sow his seed, generally thought to have been plant seeds, although there has been controversial suggestions that the pharaoh was expected to demonstrate that he could ejaculate. Yeah, this video is probably going to get demonetized. <laughs> Anyways, at the beginning of the harvest season, his image was taken out of the temple and brought to the fields in the festival of the departure of Min, when they blessed the harvest and played games naked in his honor. But hold on, the story gets weirder. Cult and worship in the pre-dynastic period surrounding a fertility god was based upon the fetish of fossilized belemnite. They fetished an extinct order of squid-like cephalopods that lived during the time of the dinosaurs. Later, the god was associated more with lettuce as the Egyptians believed it made men fertile. Civilians who were not able to formally practice the cult of Min paid homage to the god as sterility was an unfavored condition looked upon with sorrow. Statues of Min were placed at entrances of houses in hope the god would cure them. Egyptian women would touch the penises of the statues of men in hopes of pregnancy, a practice that is actually still continued to this day. So overall, pretty weird, but hey, if they saw the kind of stuff that we were doing these days, they would probably go pray for fertility. The next artifact we will be talking about is a 2000 year old ring once worn by none other than the Roman Emperor Caligula. You may have heard of him. He was a notoriously tyrannical ancient Roman emperor. He was known for a handful of sort of bad things like sleeping with other men's wives and bragging about it. 
He would send troops on illogical military exercises, made his horse a priest, and turned the palace into a brothel. To add to his list of oopsies, he killed for amusement, caused starvation, and wanted a statue of himself in the Temple of Jerusalem. Once, at some games at which he was presiding, he was said to have ordered his guards to throw an entire section of the audience into the arena during the intermission to be eaten by wild beasts because there was no prisoners to be used and he was bored. Other stories claim he committed incest with his sisters and then later prostituted them to other men. So anyways, it's not a shocker his own bodyguards eventually killed him. As bad as the guy was, man did he have a good taste in jewelry. Aesthetically, this is probably the most beautiful ring I have ever seen. Sapphire is such a beautiful material and ranks just below diamond on the hardness scale. It would have taken quite a bit of skill to not only cut and polish the sapphire, but to carve the delicate portrait on the front of the ring. So who is this beautiful woman etched into the stone? It appears to be a portrait of Caligula's fourth and last wife, Cassonia. Roman historian Suetonus described her as a woman of reckless extravagance and wantonness. Caligula and Cassonia had a passionate affair and it's said that he even occasionally showed her off naked to friends. The fun would end when not only Caligula would be assassinated, but only hours after Cassonia and her daughter were murdered. The next artifact will be quite a short one, but interesting nevertheless. A container of cosmetic face cream was discovered from a 2,000-year-old Roman pot. When researchers opened the container, they saw the finger marks of someone who is about as old as Jesus. It was so well preserved that they can even make out the fingerprints in the cream. How amazing is it that unbeknownst to the owner of the container, they would use their facial cream one last time before archaeologists would discover it two millennia later. Let it be a lesson. Some asshole in the future is going to be looking through your things, so make sure to only leave behind bizarre items like headless LeBron action figures and Lego Among Us crewmates. Anyways, the next artifact I'll be talking about is a really fascinating mammoth spear thrower from the Stone Age. This weapon, despite looking harmless, was used by ancient Europeans of the Magdalene period to throw spears with considerable force. It is made of reindeer antler to resemble the mighty woolly mammoth, and it is about 12,500 years old. These tools have a hook at the end to grab onto the projectile when throwing. However, this hook had broken off and had to be repaired with a bone insert. The spear thrower, or atlatl, is a very overlooked weapon in history. Before the bow and arrow, this tool reigned supreme for throwing spears faster and farther. One of my favorite YouTube videos is of a man killing a bison in the modern day with a primitive spear. All it took was one spear and a fairly small spearhead to take down a whole bison. It shows you just how deadly these weapons were. You didn't need some massive spearhead to take down a large animal. Even a mammoth could be taken down by less than a dozen powerful and precise shots. The next artifact I will be talking about is the Berlin Gold Hat. This hat is a late Bronze Age artifact made of thin gold leaf. It was the external covering of a long conical brimmed headdress. It is one of four other similar hats found from Bronze Age Europe so far. One was found in France while the others were found in southern Germany. It is generally thought that these hats served as the insignia of deities or priests in the sun cult, a sun-worshipping cult common around Central Europe at the time. It is also suggested that this hat served an astronomical or calendrical function. A detailed study found that the symbols represented a lunisolar calendar, so it could determine dates in both lunar and solar calendars. Sun worship actually makes a lot of sense. The sun does permit our existence with its nourishing sunlight. If it were to disappear, we would all surely die. Maybe we should go back to sun worshiping. My goal on this channel has long been to educate the public about the world we live in. I often do this by talking about prehistory, giving you a good perspective. But a facet that I often leave out, and perhaps more importantly, 
is the laws that govern our universe. In order to get a much more firm grasp about our world, check out today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem-solving app and website with a hands-on approach. They have just recently updated their scientific thinking course. Of course, I am a science channel and it is by far my favorite subject. Brilliant offers you a fresh way to learn about science, not with busy work but with interactive examples and problem solving that lets you explore the underlying principles and develop your own intuition about them. It's just one of over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and computer science. These courses can help you with school by giving you a solid understanding of various mathematical and scientific concepts. Astrophysics is a class I am currently taking on Brilliant, though I plan to take their math courses soon because I am horrible at math and need to brush up on my skills before the next semester starts. I am sure you too would enjoy expanding your knowledge on some of the topics they have courses on. To support the channel and further your understanding of these complex topics, go to brilliant.org forward slash NorthO2 to sign up for free. The first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off their subscription. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, it really helps out the channel. Check out my Instagram and comment some video ideas down below. I make videos about history of humans, ancient animals, and the occasional full length documentary. If that sounds interesting, check out the over 100 videos I have made. Well, I'll see you on the next episode of North O2. See ya.